So the initial idea for this robot came from the Rainbow Six Siege drone. It was a pretty vague idea, but this is the uh, this is the drone. Uh, if you are not aware of what this is, basically it's a drone you can throw in the game Rainbow Six Siege, and it has a camera on it. It's really small, holds uh, you can hold it in the palm of your hand, and throw it out for reconnaissance purposes. So that was the general idea. Basically, small two-wheeled robot. Uh, main goal was compact, remote control, uh, and just generally my own design. Because I mean, you can see other people have done designs like this, but I wanted to make it my own version, so that led me here. So this model right here is the first one, and this design had quite a few issues with it, but was on the right track. Actually closer to the right track than the second design was, and I'll explain why in a minute. So when I started this project, a goal of mine was, I guess somewhat lazily, to not have to drive the wheels in any special way. I, what I mean by that is, you can see the shaft of the motor right here, it's this part, and you can see the wheel is obviously much larger. This wheel would not properly work with this. I, I put a, ro a rotational mate here, but the wheel would not drive on this motor, it's pretty obvious. There'd need to be some sort of adapter or mount point. But the issue is, given how small the shaft is, when the weight of the entire robot is pushing down, it bends this shaft up just enough that the wheel can slide off, and meanwhile, that bending can really damage your motor. So this is known as direct driving wheels or uh, cantilevering wheels. It's it's Those two things are different, but both of them are happening here. Uh, the direct driving is driving directly from the shaft, and the cantilevering is because the wheel here is attached in one point to one side. There's nothing on the other side keeping it from sliding off. So those are two really big issues. On top of that, when I was talking about size, just the chassis is, let's see here, just the chassis is almost 10 inches across, add wheels, again, with nothing on the outside of them, and you're looking at over a foot wide. That's kind of big. That's more than I wanted. Uh, so there's a lot of ways I could have gone about fixing this, and I tried to do that in various versions. But take note here of the general system. We have two motors, we have two wheels, and then we have some cross beams going between these plates. And this plate, I'm going to show you what this plate looks like. It's pretty simple. But this, this idea was something I carried through the entire design of having a motor plate that would hold the motors and the frame. And when it held those together, I could put things in between them and I could hang stuff off the bars. That's actually why I chose in the version here to use this bar stock. This is a 8020 aluminum uh, slotted extrusion hardware, which we use in uh, first FTC a lot. I compete in first FTC for uh, team 7462. And this stuff we use a lot for prototyping, and I was thinking, well, I have some electronics to fit on here. I can slot it right through here and fit it all over the place. That ended up not being the case, and this stuff is pretty heavy. So I changed this material in the second model. Uh, overall, it would have been a pretty strong construction, but the wheel design just stopped this in its tracks. So moving on to the second version, here's the model for that. And you might be able to notice some problems with this pretty quickly, depending on how much experience you have in engineering and works like that. Uh, the wheels, by the way, would fit. It would work. They would touch the ground and things would work out. But this one falls into similar problems as the last one, and then even more so. So I was still trying to make it smaller, first off. But the width here is the same width. Uh, it's not really getting better. So I tried to shrink it in the other two dimensions. And so you can see the entire frame fits just within the boundaries of this tire. But this design was pretty like stopped pretty immediately due to fitting electronics. Because of course, when you're designing a robot, you don't just put motors in. I mean, where are your motors going to get your power? And then on top of that, where are your motors going to get control? Because remember, the goal is to have a remote control robot using two motors to power two wheels. So that means I need two motor controllers, one for each motor, because the motor controllers that I'm used to using only power one motor, and it's a whole lot easier to do that. You can control them individually that way. On top of that, you need an RC receiver. And in my case, because I was using stock electronics from FTC, I need a power converter uh, and a battery. None of those things would be able to fit in here. When I'm talking about a battery, it's a much more significant brick than like a double A or anything. And even that wouldn't fit in here with the wiring. There's just no space. So here's the plate, the second plate. And you can see what I mean. So I shrunk down the stock I was using. I used this, uh, this churro material instead. It's a whole lot smaller than the slotted extrusion, 
but comes with quite a few drawbacks, including that it can't actually have anything slotted into it that stays. Uh, but the benefit is that it's smaller, so that's the point. But this plate here, you can see how little space there is, right? So the motor fits here, three pieces right here, and then you're left with this space for like nine and a half inches, and that's all the space you have to run everything else you need. That's a bunch of wiring, four electronic components, and a big battery. No way is that going to fit. On top of that, it's it still fails even more because I was still trying to get away with not direct driving wheels, or, or rather with direct driving wheels, because driving indirectly is a whole lot more more work and it does take a lot of space. On top, uh, and I haven't I hadn't even tried it before this, so I had learned it through this project. So this shaft again drives straight through the wheel. There are pieces that attach this these this mount point four holes and one bigger one to this sort of cutoff circle. So that does exist. But once again, cantilevered and direct driven. So this robot would still be in, at risk of damaging the motors, and it would definitely be at, at risk of losing wheels. In my first year in robotics, I designed our chassis, and I designed it much this way, where the wheels would just fall off. And they did this in competition. Four of our six wheels fell off over the course of two rounds. Uh, we had to fix those. So this is really a big issue. If you haven't done this before, this actually does mess things up pretty seriously. So moving on to the third version, which ended up being the final version, there's a whole lot more in this sorted file directory here. So I'll get into it. This is the design here, and you'll notice probably pretty immediately this looks fine, a lot more final. So I'm going to go into this part by part and explain what I did to fix the problems. But the thing, especially if you're not experienced with this project, that you'll probably notice immediately is it looks really different. It's a lot bigger, and that is very true. Going from the maximum outside, ignoring the extra shaft material, which is cut off, it's 13 and a half inches. Now that's definitely more space than I wanted, but on top of that, instead of the three or four inches of the previous model, this one goes, oh, about 12 inches back too. So it really did get a lot bigger. But take note of these red pieces. These red pieces are all electronic components. So this right here is the battery. This is a huge chunk of material. Like, this is just really large. Actually, I want to go back to the version 2 here and show you how big this is in comparison. Uh, so I can see it right here. Here's the battery. So you might see what I mean, right? How could this battery ever fit anywhere near this robot? It's not going to fit in. Uh, if I were to actually go ahead and rotate this such that it would be pretty close to fitting, it still just would not fit at all. So, that is why I made it so much bigger. But, it took a lot of a lot further design to make this work right. So, handling the cantilevered wheels took these extra plates outside. These plates, you can see, hold the wheels into a certain area. They have the shaft coming through here, and this is a bearing that would be rotating. So, this happens on both sides, and I used extra pieces of churro out here to hold it together. Well, just like the previous version, there's these internal pieces that hold the inner plates in. So the drive plate here, I believe it's in this. Yeah, okay. So here is the plate that I use. This is the same thing as that circle in the square you saw earlier. This is exactly the same plate. It's a whole lot more complicated. This took a lot more work to get right. Here's where your motor sits. Here, these four holes are where those outer plates connect via the churro to the outside. So those four holes connect to these four on each side. So now I want to get into, I want to do a little transition here and get into how this design came together with the more complicated elements I hadn't tried before. So that's mainly what I've been talking about with these uh, driving motors indirectly and fitting electronics in. So talking about driving motors indirectly, you can see these wheels are a lot more complicated than they were the first time. Originally, they just sat on the shaft and that was it. Obviously not the case anymore. I'm using this stuff. This is half-inch hex shaft. This is used in FRC, uh, the larger weight class of robots for first challenges. And it's running between two bearings here and with these stacked up elements. There's bolts that go through here. You'll see in the actual live videos of this robot. And it's all held in place. But this right here, this gold piece, this is the pulley. This is a 3D printed pulley that would work with a, I believe it's a GT2 timing belt. Uh, 
That's a similar belt used on a 3D printer. If you ever use one of those, it's basically one of those belts. So I have two of those, and then here are your motors again. So these motors would have had another pulley on them. I didn't need to design it in because designing pulleys isn't really that important on the end of a motor, you see. So once again, there's nothing holding on the end of the motor, right? But because the motor is just, just a pulley, which drives out to here, and this is held securely, there's no excess torque on this shaft, which will avoid breaking the motor. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how this works, but on the inside of one of these motors is a gearbox, very delicate gearbox. If you, if this motor is spinning really fast, which these motors do, and then you crank the shaft, say, up or down, then your motor's going to be in real trouble. It really is going to start breaking gears, and I've done this before. It really does hurt them. So... That's how I avoided that here. I have these properly fitted bearings and the belts and everything to work, make this work. And I think I have a video over here of that one going. Here it is. So this right here, when it loads, is a video showing the belts. You can see around here, this is that gold pulley, and here's the new pulley down here. So you can see the battery right here, that's the red one. I'll get to this in a minute. And I'm trying to get a close-up on these stacked motors, I'll show you in a moment. So, that's that. So, the next bit that I want to talk about, and I referenced this just a second ago, I'm going to cut away the robot, and I'm going to show you the inside here. This is actually a really cool tool, you can watch the wheels being picked apart, so you can actually see how the wheels go together in here. I think this is just an interesting side note, you see there's a plate, and a plate, and a bearing, and a bearing, and the long shaft goes through all of it. Here's a spacer, here's something that attaches with a set screw, here's the pulley, and then these two frame the wheel and keep it where it is. Anyway, kind of beside the point. So getting rid of all that, we get to this. Now this is how the motors are mounted. The plates in this case are not symmetrical, like they were in previous models where I used two of the same plate. Instead, I used two plates, that were the same in every way, except for that the motor on one was on top and on the other was on bottom. And these motors then are mounted above or below the pulley. But what this allows me to do is it compresses the inside of this robot down to only, I forget this number here, um, down to only five inches inside the plates. That's a big improvement, given that the previous models didn't have to do any of this outside stuff. So that really actually does improve the entire size of this, because imagine if I had seven more inches inside here, this robot would have been way bigger. And size is still a concern of mine, even after I conceded that I had to make it a little bit bigger so that it would hold itself together. Um, so these motors here are stacked right in between, I'm gonna turn the section viewer off again. They're stacked right in between the battery and the electronics. And this is where the next step came in. I didn't know the electronics details until I got to this model. When I did, I took measurements of them. So these two up here are motor controllers. This here is an RC receiver. It has a little wire that comes out here and receives RC input. And this is a power converter. So the battery, you saw there was a mess of wires in that video I showed you. The battery here comes up and then around and through here. And then it is routed down below the motor controllers where it comes in the other side over here of a power converter. That power converter comes out and then powers this and both of these. Then the motor wires get connected to the two motor controllers and the motor controllers wire back to the RC hub. That means that everything's powered and when I power on the RC controller, it has control over the motor controllers, which have control over the wheels. That allows me to control each wheel independently of one another. That's how I, would, I was able to, in that previous video, drive them in opposite directions. That's obviously important because that's how you turn. So that's the electronics of this, and I'll, I'll talk about this piece here in a bit. Originally this wasn't actually here. Uh, I actually had the battery moved all the way back inside here, and this actually worked out pretty well to make the robot smaller, but I added that piece later for a different reason. So that's this model. That is actually a lot of the design, but what I wanted to do after that 
let's make this a little bit more interesting. Because to people that haven't seen it before, it's pretty boring, honestly. It's kind of hard to to say, hey, look, it's a robot that drives. Isn't that exciting, right? But if you add this, then it gets a little more exciting. This right here is a three-barrel Nerf gun. So most people have used Nerf blasters before. But I decided, wouldn't it be cool if I could bring this to outreach events and fire three Nerf darts out of a robot that I can drive by hand from the corner of the room? So I can have, I can have kids drive around this thing and go shoot out into the open, uh, like open fields and stuff, right? So that was the idea, and I just thought it would be cool myself. So I went about designing this piece. And this piece took a long time. I've told several people this piece took, I believe it was about four hours the first day of just design work, and I got very little. I ended up getting... So this is my first concept. I think this is funny. This is my first idea going into it. I still have a trigger mechanism back here, but wow, this is this is rough. Like, there's no mount point at all. It's pretty tough. Um... So this is where I went after that. I went for a box design, which you saw previously, and I'll talk about why this is so different in a minute. So this original design was based off of the Nerf Jolt. Uh, that's the little orange one, looks kind of like a flare gun. And that design, I had a couple of those lying around, so I kind of cannibalized them. I took out the plungers and I sized everything up properly. And when I had sized it up, I found out all the right dimensions for this inner tube. Uh, so I'm going to take this apart like I did the previous one. And this is three tubes, all identical, that look like this. So you can see where the, the Nerf dart would go in here, and the plunger sits back here. Now in the Nerf Jolt, they use a little tab like this. It's all made out of ABS or whatever plastic they use. And it's attached to a little lever that the lever is pulled by the trigger. So I decided to do the same thing, except without a trigger. I was going to just make this little plastic tab. Uh, it actually, I'm going to cut a little, a little more away here. Um, so cutting just a little bit more away like that, you can see this trigger. So it's actually free floating, except for right in here. This is the attachment point. Now what I was relying on was the plunger pulling back against a spring to build power. And the little ring of the plunger would pop over this. It's hard to say that, uh, to explain this without seeing the plunger yourself, but bear with me because I don't have a model of that. It was it would have been a lot less effective if I had modeled the plunger myself. Um, so the idea was it would push this down, get stuck over this little rim, and as soon as this got pulled down somehow, the plunger would shoot forward and launch the dart out with the pressure wave of the air. Now, this gets into where this sort of failed. My idea for pulling this down was to use a little tiny thread in here and then run that thread through this hole up here all the way to the front and do that three times and run each of those into three servo motors. Servo motors are the little motors used on the claws and stuff. That failed honestly pretty miserably. So there are a lot of issues with this. One of them, this model is unruly to print. It's really hard to print. So printing it properly, I kind of have to print it like this, like with this being the print bed. It takes 10 to 15 hours to print one of these. Really, really bad. And on top of that, this is weak. Uh, it's hard to get a sense of scale watching these models, I know that, but this is only 0.14 inches wide. That's a little more than an eighth of an inch wide of plastic. And that's that's like the widest dimension. It's, it's only 0.085 inches tall. And that's the dimension it's bending in. So you're bending something that's less than a tenth of an inch, and every time one of these breaks, you have to replace the entire box. That just sounds like a bad idea. So this model had a lot of issues going on with it. And on top of that, these were not big enough and not strong enough to hold the plunger back. It's fighting against a six or eight pound spring, I believe. And that's just nowhere near strong enough. This tiny, tiny piece of plastic that is only, uh, it's a, a little less than 0.1 inches tall. Um, so we're running into kind of a lot of issues, as you might be able to understand here. So I set this aside for a little bit, because this design, I probably spent 8, 10, 12 hours working on this design, getting it to this far, and then I printed several versions of, like, one-third of it. I would take, uh, I would actually get rid of uh, two-thirds of the model, so I could test just one-third. I'd uh, print it basically like this, and then I'd try it out, and it just wouldn't work, and wouldn't work, and wouldn't work. And I set it aside for a bit, and tried the next 
uh, moved on to the next project for a bit, did the build season for robotics the next year. Now, I promise, I'm not joking, but it actually took a dream to come up with this next design. Uh, that's super weird to me. That's never happened, and that's just kind of bizarre, but it did. Uh, that's literally what happened. So I, I came up with this new version, and this version right here uses two different pieces. So it's all very, very similar. This all looks really, really similar to what it was before, except for these two, which I'll get to. They're really less important than you think, and this. This here is the trigger. So I can actually say hide this, and it this is the trigger piece. So this little piece here is a long slider that I can print on its own, on the print bed, flat, and slip right into the barrels. Because I have, I can say show this again and hide these. I have the slit right here. And so you slip the barrels or the, the triggers in straight through. And then as you move the triggers up and down, it raises and lowers this little ridge here which is both significantly wider than the previous version. That's point one, and that's not the whole thing. It's it's about it's about double the width of the previous trigger. It's a whole piece, and worst case, it breaks. I print it again. This print here for this piece takes an hour, right? This one takes 15, one hour here. Really easy, so I can iterate on this easily. So I created this design, and this allowed me to shoot Nerf darts, which is a huge success. Uh, but it came at a cost. Originally, the goal of the project was to be able to fire three nerf darts individually, in, or rather independently. That was the goal, but I kind of sacrificed it with this part. It's a whole lot easier to fire three nerf darts at once than it is to fire three nerf darts individually. That was a problem I ran into routinely. I have a couple ideas for how to change this design and make it work a little better. I may end up implementing those, but it works pretty well right now. So. What I ended up doing was putting a servo motor here and a servo motor here, uh, mounted them with VHB tape. That's basically just really strong double stick tape, if you're not aware. And I hooked actually a paper clip through here and through here. And then as the motor would rotate, it would uh, pull the trigger up or down, and that would release the plunger after it had been pulled back. This trigger actually was attached with a rubber band up to these two. So it would be permanently pulled up. And then as you pull the, the plunger back, it makes that satisfying click that you get when you pull a nerf dart primer, a nerf, nerf blaster primer uh, back. You always see that little click and it stays in place. Mine does exactly the same thing. So I don't have a video of me priming it, but I do have a video of it firing. So you can see these rubber bands and the servo motors here. I'm just going to pause it. Here's a servo motor. So if, if you're not aware of what one of these is, little rotating piece here. It rotates slowly to the control. Here's two paper clips attached through. Here is the trigger. You can see this little triangle and here's the back plate. The back plate's not there in the picture. Uh, in the, the CAD model, but these are the three plungers taken directly from the Nerf gun, and we're going to see it fire. It's going to fire very quickly here. So, so it gets some range. That was actually one of the worst shots I got. Uh, I think I have another video here of it. So his, this is the design, just covering this. So those are all primed, by the way. Watch here. So you might be able to see it move just a little bit. It only needs to move maybe a quarter of an inch to get a firing. It's a pretty hair trigger. So this was the design for this model, and I've since brought it to outreach events and gotten the whole thing going where I've shown it off to kids and had them test firing it and everything. I've tried various other versions of it to see if I can make it better, decided to pause again on the project and write this, uh, write an overview of it and make this video. Uh, this is actually all the information I have for today. Uh, Hopefully, this is understandable. It's pretty confusing if you haven't done some robotics work and some design work. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, comment and I will respond. Uh, thanks for watching this video. And I will be, I think by the time I post this, the description will have uh, a link to an, a sort of report that I made covering this information and a little more in some more revised depth uh, so that I can actually get the information across and hopefully a more understandable way with some prepared pictures and things. So make sure you take a look at that. I put some work in on that to get some good documentation going for this and show how the various versions differed and the problems and the solutions and all that. Uh, this is a super fun project. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, see you later.